Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Formal Specification and Taming Other People's Tech. My name is Marianne Bellotti. I will be your guide for today. Um, I had a really hard time figuring out what to name this talk um, because really this is about specifications for beginners by, maybe it's not fair to call myself a beginner, but certainly a non-expert, right? But I didn't really like calling it a for beginners talk because it's so much more interesting and compelling the kind of powerful things you can do. It's not just about the basics of what you can do with formal specifications. It's about like why you wanna do this in the first place. And this is a really fun time to kind of have come to this conference, which is one of my favorite conferences, to give a talk like this because it's apparently like the unofficial theme of Strange Loop this year, formal specification. This is like one of three different talks on the subject that you can like watch. Uh, and there was a pre-conf all on TLA Plus, which is one of the larger variants of formal specification. So let's start off with what exactly is formal specification. Well, if you think about a written spec, you, this is something that you might write down to define roughly what it is you're programming. You might list your inputs, you might list your expected behaviors, like exactly what it is your program is doing, uh, your legal outputs, and then if you're really clever, some illegal behavior that you absolutely shouldn't do with this program. And the significance of formal specification is basically that we're putting this in a structured syntax and then we're loading it up into a model checker, essentially a computer, that runs scenario analysis. It takes all of the possible states that it can figure out from your spec and it checks your illegal behavior and sees for, looks for states that have violated your illegal behavior. So this is super cool. You find some really interesting bugs and other like things with your code that you didn't expect to happen. But from personal experience, like learning this stuff feels like you're riding in a speeding car going 60 miles an hour straight into a brick wall. Like the learning curve on this is very, very, very steep. But I really like it because I really like thinking in edge cases and um, especially like outliers and things like that. So it was very, from the moment that I was introduced to it, it was very, very attractive to me as a concept. I should like, full disclosure, I should tell you that um, while I'm not a beginner, I'm probably pretty terrible at this stuff. But actually, that was the main reason why I wanted to give this talk rather than like something I was scared of. Because even though I think that most of my specs are senseless and um, that they don't add the level of value of some other people that I've seen in, in this community, I still got a lot of value out of it. And we still found bugs in our code. And uh, we still, we, it still like increased the rigor of my engineering practice. And this sort of tied more broadly into my philosophical perspective on engineering teams themselves. Uh, right now I'm an engineering manager, I run engineering teams, and one of the things I tell the engineers that work for me is that you will never understand something on the level that you need to understand it when you have to teach it to somebody else. So the least efficient engineering teams in my experience are the ones that are filled with experts and geniuses. And the most efficient ones are the ones that have a more diverse array of like experts and people who are just starting to figure out like all the things that they need to know in order to make this work. And so one of the conversations we've been having is we've just been overloaded and spoiled with all of this content about formal specifications this weekend is like, how do we get more people involved in this community? Why, if these tools are so powerful, are they not broader used? And I think it's really because we have such like this glut of experts and that when you come into the community, you get hit with the barrier to entry. And the next thing you notice is there are all these like super amazing legendary programmers who are using it and you are not one of them, and that's very intimidating. So the point of this talk is primarily to like lower the intimidation factor um, and kind of introduce different ways you can start to use formal specifications that are not mm, commonly part of the conversation. Because what is generally part of the conversation is the AWS use case of like, oh, they use it to build S3, isn't that cool? It is, it is very cool. And like, oh, Microsoft uses it for Amazon, for uh, Azure services, isn't that cool? And this is also very cool. But the reality of it is that most software engineers will never build their own message queue, right? You'll download something that's open source, you'll buy it from your cloud provider, you're not going to start to like just build your own message queues for, for fun. And yet, you can use specification for lots of other things. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background. I work for Auth0. We do identity as a service. Basically, what that means is logins. And specifically, I run the platform services teams, um, which are shared services that all the other engineering teams of Auth0 use. And so these include things like rate limits, feature flags, email notifications, so on and so forth. And what's significant to know about my team is that by and large, we did not build the services that we now own. What usually happens is that an engineering team at Auth0 needs a particular service and they get really excited and they go and they build the, the service that they need. Um, and then other engineering teams see it and they go, that's really cool, I also need that service. Can I hook in and use your service? And they go, sure. And so this goes on and it, we get broader and broader adaption until finally the original engineering team goes, you know, actually, we have a product roadmap and like literally none of this stuff is on the product roadmap. So we can't really maintain this service that now everyone is using. So this is where my team kind of comes in. We come in and we take over the service and sometimes they've been working beautifully but they haven't actually been maintained. Uh, they may have things that are out of date with them. There may be problems that are not, although not significant, are pretty structural. And so we come in and if there are no SLOs, we define SLOs, uh, we evaluate the situation situation of technical debt, and then we study the existing problems and kind of look at rethinking the architecture. So there's one service I'm going to talk about a lot in this session, and it's our email notification service. And so we're not an email company. We don't want to run your mail server for you, right? Like we do logins, we don't do emails. But if you think about the workflow of login, it's still very heavily dependent on email. Email is like the lowest level of identity proofing, right? So we have an issue because like what we would really like you to do is go to some of these companies like SendGrid, Mandrill, SparkPost, and like sign up for an account with them, even a free account, because like they run mail servers, they're mail providers, that's what they do. And so they can put all the time and resources into doing that super well. We want you to do that and then integrate those services with us. But we also want to make our onboarding experience as smooth and effortless as possible. So if you're signing up for an account with us and I need to say like, okay, stop, now go to this completely other company and sign up for an account there and then come back, we lose a whole bunch of people right away, right? So what do we do? We have this thing called the shared provider, which is basically like a little mail server that we maintain. So when you're onboarding, you're getting used to using the product, you're figuring it out, um, you can have emails and everything works great. And the compromise that we make here is that we keep saying like, please don't use this in production. And we also rate limit you. You get a certain number of emails per hour that you can send to the shared provider. And under the old algorithm, when you exceeded that rate limit, what we did with the emails that came through after that is we dumped them into a retry queue and waited a little bit until your rate limit had gone back up and then retried them. But designing this service to work this way assumes that emails kind of grow in a fairly linear fashion. That when you first sign up, you have a low level of email traffic, and then as it goes, you get higher and higher. And so eventually you get to the point where you're going over that rate limit fairly predictably, and then we get to call you up and say, hey, by the way, did you hear we're not an email company, but there are some great, great companies that we can refer you to that will like fix this problem for you. Please don't use the shared provider for production anymore. Um, but that's not actually the behavior that we see on the shared provider. The behavior that we actually see looks more like this. There'll be a fairly low level of uh, email traffic, and then the user will do something, I gotta be honest, usually by accident, that blasts out an email to literally all of their users all at once. Now sometimes that's like a couple hundred emails, sometimes that's like a couple hundred thousand emails. So what would happen is that the retry queue would fill up to the point where it would take many, many hours for it to send all those emails and pager duty would go off and one of my engineers would get woken up in the middle of the night to essentially log on and run a command that would basically just clear all of these emails out of the retry queue. So, when they were taking me through this for the first time, they were like, what we want to do is we want to change the rate limiting algorithm so that instead of retrying it, we just delete them because we're going to delete them anyway, so why don't we just automate it, right? But there's this question, how do we know that that behavior is safe? Because once you delete something, you're kind of, yeah, that's it, right? Like there's no real undo with dropping an email. So this is the point where I was like, cool, I'm gonna go write some specs, I'll be right back, right? 
And uh, this is where we're going to get into the nitty gritty of like how should you think about like formal specification. And the first piece of advice I want to give you is that when you, if you're a programmer, you're used to thinking of algorithms as being in steps. And when you start specifying things, you need to start thinking about them as being in states. Because what model checkers do is they look for every possible combination of state that can be uh, valid in your spec. And if your spec has branching logic in it, then they look for every possible combination of those branches, and so on and so forth. So depending on how much variance you've programmed into your spec, this can be a lot and lot and a lot and a lot, lot of situations. And model checkers are usually able to handle this pretty efficiently because some of these uh, branches, some of these uh, states may violate some conditions that you've written in, in which case the model checker will just error automatically and say, by the way, I found an error. Um, and some of them, it's smart enough to go, oh, I've seen this series of states before. I've already checked it. It's fine. Just forget it, whatever. But the concepts of states is pretty is significant to formal specification. For one reason or another, a couple months ago, I decided that I really wanted to start playing around with using formal specification to model interactions between systems. And I started with load balancers. This idea of you have a cluster of machines and a load balancer, and like how does the configuration of that load balancer affect the safety of that cluster? And I was like, when I first wrote, the, the first spec I wrote was actually like super literal on that point, right? So it was like, we got three VMs, we are using CPU utilization as a sign of whether they're healthy or unhealthy, and so like we, they can have anywhere from zero to 100 CPU utilization, and 70 means they're unhealthy, and blah, 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 and I wanna test all the possible states and combinations to see like whether the world balancer does the right thing. Fine, except, um, if you are running all of these scenarios, you end up with a lot of scenarios that kind of don't, like they're not worthwhile to test, right? So if we know that something is good at 45% CPU utilization and we know it's good at 47% utilization, testing 46% utilization is kind of a waste of CPU cycles on my machine and a, certainly a whole bunch of time. Um, so I was like, cool, I know what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna divide it by 10 so that it's, we're only testing between zero and 10 instead of zero and 100, and that will do it. And that was much better than I was testing, like 40%, 50%, 60%, but it still wasn't super satisfying. I didn't feel like I was really testing anything important. And then I realized that really the only thing that mattered was whether it was healthy or unhealthy. And the numbers I had assigned to that healthy or unhealthy were completely irrelevant. I didn't need to bother with the numbers at all. What I needed to do was design a state machine, essentially. And so I went back and I rethought about this and I was like, okay, so we have our cluster and it has three states. It's either in a normal state, it's either not enough work for all the machines so it's idle, or too much work for all the machines, it's unhealthy. And it sort of toggles between these three states. And that's very easy to build a super, super simple spec around. I can just basically say these are my three states, and this is the branching logic that leads from one to the other, and then I can set some constraints on it that says like, hey, there should be like more than zero servers. And like, let's say uh, 11 servers is over-provisioned and, and AWS like knocks me out at that point. So let's say it should be less than 10 servers, right? So there's a problem with this model um, that makes it frustrating and, 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 and feel like it's not useful, uh, useful endeavor. And that is, it kind of factors in a lot of probability. And you wanna, when you're doing specs, kind of leave your notion of probability at home, just divorce yourself from it. Everything is all equal, regardless of how likely or unlikely it is. And the reason why this is a problem for this spec is because when you run it, you'll have like these mm, thousands of scenarios where sometimes the load balancer kills a server and sometimes the load balancer creates a server and like it mainly stays somewhere in the bounds of that between zero and 10. And then you will have the one case where it literally just keeps killing the server over and over and over. And you will run this model and the first thing you will say is like, I found a problem. You could just keep killing the server forever. And I'm like, yeah, no duh. <laughs> like, that feels like it would never happen in real life, um, or that it would happen very rarely, and that's not the kind of bugs that are going to impress people on Hacker News, so this is really just not 
this is not what I want to be spending my time on, right? So, like, you really got to remember that the, the formal specifications is designed for system safety. It's designed for the idea of correctness. It's not designed for thumbs up, looks good, no problem, don't worry about it. So any, any state that could violate conditions is considered equal to all of the other states in, in that full array. It doesn't matter that there are a million states where everything is fine. If there's one state where things are not fine, that, it, that is considered just as important as the millions of cases where everything is fine. But this state machine is actually also a bit naive, truth be told, because um, load balancers don't arbitrarily flip a coin and decide you're healthy and you're not healthy. There's another state that's not represented in it, which is the health check. So I was like, all right, let's go back and let's model the health check. And so, and by the way, this is like the, the most complicated spec you're gonna see in this talk. So like, if you can handle this, you're good. Um, the, I, this is uh, just a quick model of a health check, and there are a couple things you need to know about it. Essentially what it says is it specifies that if there are several unhealthy servers, then you create a new server. If all the servers are healthy but there are more than three, then you shut one down. And uh, else we're going to just assume that if there are a couple unhealthy servers but not enough to do anything about, we're going to just kill them and reboot them and, and go back to the way things were in the beginning. Um, and this was also very unsatisfying for, for a very particular reason, and that is this line of code right here. Um, here I am incrementing a variable called cycle by one, and the reason why I was doing this is because I thought, oh, but wait, I've definitely seen cases where little balancers just keep rebooting servers over and over and over and over and over again. How would I represent that? Oh, well, I would increment it every time it cycles, and then that would tell me when that was happening. And this was about the point when I realized this fundamental flaw in how I was approaching this issue is that I wasn't actually defining a difference between a state being impossible and a state being simply undesirable. And I was gravitating towards all of these states that were undesirable, but like totally normal things that we know load balancers do. Like we know load balancers occasionally just kill servers over and over and over again. Um, that doesn't make them unsafe, that just means that like priorities, we don't define this as an impossible condition. So, I started to realize, oh, I really need to start thinking about what states are impossible rather than what states are simply like nasty to deal with, right? So this is kind of like one of the things that I really love about formal specifications is that I keep finding myself in places where it completely flips my thinking about programming concepts and about how I'm approaching problems and I find that r really engaging. I'm maybe a little bit of a masochist on that point. So. Now we gotta start asking ourselves which states should be impossible given what we're thinking about in terms of our state machine and not simply just undesirable. So let's go back to um, my shared provider, our mail server. I need to like back up a little bit and explain a little bit about how our rate limiting algorithm works. We use something called a token bucket algorithm. Actually, technically we use a leaky token bucket algorithm, but uh, the leaky for the purpose of this talk is not pretty significant, so I'm just gonna like simplify it a little bit on this front. And the way a token bucket algorithm works is that you have a bucket, per customer, and that bucket can fit a certain number of tokens that get issued at a certain constant rate. And when an email comes in and says, I would like to be sent out to the world, it goes to the bucket, and the bucket says, here's your token, go on by, right? And uh, when the email comes in and there are no tokens, the token bucket says, sorry, you gotta go off to the retry queue for you, wait around until there are more tokens in the bucket. And so, to be clear, um, we don't actually write code to represent buckets and tokens. This is done in Redis, and it's done mainly with timestamps and pre-designed constants about like rates of tokens into the bucket and uh, how many tokens can fit in a bucket and whatnot. So, given all of this, though, how do we make this look like a state machine? Well, our email has three, basically three states. We go from queued to a worker to sent. And then our token bucket has two states. It, is either, it has, either has tokens or it has no tokens. 
And so from a state machine perspective, that looks basically like this, with the email going from queer to query, queued to with the worker to check the token to either sent or retried back to the queue. And we want to change it to this, queued with the worker, sent or dropped. And given this, what states with the state machine should be impossible? Well, if we have a token, we shouldn't just be deleting emails. Uh, if there's no token, it shouldn't be sent. If it's deleted, it shouldn't be then sent. And if it's sent, it shouldn't be deleted, although in fairness, that last one may be not such a big deal in the first place. But uh, anyway, these are the states that should be illegal given the state machine. And so how does our implementation prevent these states. And this is the point where I kind of say that the thing that I, I most appreciate about formal specifications is that a lot of times I don't have to actually run the model. I've already found something out that's really useful and significant just by trying to think through how the hell I'm going to write the specification in the first place. And this was definitely a situation where we had a couple of those trying to write this model. We go back to this idea of we got these huge bulk blasts of emails, and um, we want to just delete them automatically. Uh, but then we think to ourselves, well, wait a minute, what if when we get this huge blast of, say, like email validation emails, um, there's a user on this tenant's website or application or whatever they're using us for who is trying to log in and has forgotten their password? That would mean that the bucket is stripped of all its tokens, we're now deleting emails, and oh, shoot, we just deleted an email that really should have gone out in the first place. Um, and so, like, what do we do about this? How do we solve this? And what we realized is, oh, wait a minute, we don't need, we need multiple buckets for all the email types so that you can blow away your tokens for one type and then emails from the other type still go through because they're still allowed to. I was like, okay, great, so what should that look like, right? And so we start to think about this in terms of like, well, we've got a certain amount of tenants, those are our customers, and then we've got a certain number of email types that we rate limit, and so like that's X number of buckets, and so like maybe we're building like a spec based on like for each tenant, there are a certain number of buckets, and what does that look like? And so this is the part where like I talk about the thing that drove me the most crazy for the longest period of time, and that is loops, loops and specs, right? Loops will mess you up, right? Um, largely because there are some formal specification types that don't have them at all, and then there are some formal specification types that have what looks like a loop from a programmer's perspective, but behaves very differently. So for example, let's suppose that we had a list of possible states, A, B, and C. We iterate through it, and we print out the current state. If we ran this spec, what the spec would print out would be A, and then B, and then C, exactly what we would expect. Now let's change it a little bit. Let's say we have a list, another list, outside of the loop, and then we take that same situation, but instead of printing out the current state, we append it to the list that's outside of the loop, and then we print that. Um, what, is, what do we think this one prints? Something like this, maybe? Yeah, okay, no, it doesn't at all. If you run this, <laughs> this is what it prints. It prints a list with A in it, it prints a list in B with it, and it prints a list with C in it. And it drove me absolutely crazy because I was doing much more complicated things than, than this, and it was just not working out, and I didn't understand why. But the reason why it does this is again, we go back to that concept of steps versus states. When you iterate something in a programming language, you're going A, then B, then C. When you iterate something in a spec, you are probably creating a branch of all of those states. So instead, you're going A or B or C. And the fact that it does this in roughly the same order as where it appears in the list is kind of just irrelevant. It's just the way it does it, right? So given that, we realize that we don't need to model a whole bunch of tenants and then a whole bunch of buckets. What we really need to do is focus on this very simple relationship between a tenant with a certain number of buckets per email type. And Actually, we really just need to focus on email types going to the correct buckets. And then once we got it down to that, then it was like, oh, wait, 
this is basically the kind of problem that you see in like every like intro to formal specification. Like Alice wants to send Bob some money for her account, and does she have money in her account? Like it's basically it's the same sort of problem. We're trying to figure out if the the message is going to the correct bucket, and uh, if we have capacity in that bucket. So it was like, okay, cool, we can do it that way. But let's go back to this idea of undesirable versus impossible, because there's another problem that we found while writing this spec, which is, okay, we we'll go back to this, we get a bulk blast of email ver verification emails, add a tokens, start dropping emails, and then at the same time, instead of a password reset, we get a user that tries to create a new account on this particular application. And what do we do when we create a new account? we send an email verification email. So now we have another state where a single email that is not related to the bulk email problem that we are trying to solve is getting caught up and deleted when it probably shouldn't be. But there's a question of like whether this is a state that should be impossible or whether it's simply undesirable and something that we can say to the customer, you should not be using this for a live application in production. Please, again, go to any one of these beautiful companies that will more than happy do all your emails, right? Um, but what's really significant about this issue is that we can't actually solve it with our rate limiting, right? It's really difficult to solve that kind of issue with our rate limiting. What we need to do in order to solve it is go further up the pipeline to the publishers. And these are Auth0 engineering teams that are building different parts of our uh, service that are basically dumping emails into our queue. And so we spent some time with that, like how do you solve for a problem like that? And then that kind of triggered the question of like, wait, why are we letting publishers just dump things straight into our queue? Because actually when we spent some time to think about it, the, there are a whole bunch of problems that if we simply put up an HTTP endpoint that they would use um, to put emails into the queue would also be solved by doing that. We could get better tracking of like bulk actions and prevent them. Um, but we could also do better val uh, verification of data. And uh, if we wanted to migrate off our current message queue and onto something different, we could do that more easily than if we were uh, letting them just dump it right into the queue. So to summarize, these are my basic thoughts on how you should start to approach formal specifications so that you do not have to have the, the, uh, the terrible hot wheel climb that I had through this process. Uh, first one is make it look like a state machine. Second one is define the states that should be impossible given that state machine. Third piece of advice, then focus your model on what makes that impossible, what prevents that state from happening. And so if you want some help about getting started, some inspiration, I got some ideas because it turns out there are lots of things that you probably use on your engineering team right now that already look like state machines. So for example, yesterday at TLA uh, Plus Preconf, I was talking to somebody and he's like, I really want to use TLA Plus, but I don't know like where to even start and I'm a front end engineer. And I was like, awesome, do you use React? And he was like, yeah. I was like, do you use Redux? And he's like, yeah. I was like, Redux is the state machine. So you're halfway there already. Um, and actually, this is a, a common enough like uh, realization that there are a couple of blog posts about like Redux as a state machine and using model checking. Um, when I was at the Recurse Center like two years ago, shout out to Recurse Center, there was somebody actually working on modeling uh, their Redux application with TLA Plus as if it was a state machine. And so like there's a, a fair, for TLA Plus, there's a fair amount of documentation on how you want to approach that. Other thing that looks like a state machine, uh, AWS Lambda has this thing called step functions that will basically turn lambdas into state machines. So that's another opportunity if you're using that, you can sort of start from there and start modeling things. And then if you're doing any kind of workflow orchestration, there is technically a difference between workflow orchestration and state machines, but for the purposes of this kind of modeling, it's kind of irrelevant what the difference between them is. So if you're using Airflow or Conductor or Luigi or anything like that, you already have something that looks like a state machine ready to go in your stack and you can sort of start to go from there. So that basically brings me to the end of my talk. Um, if this is of any interest to you, you can reach out to me over the Slack and I will also say that I am hiring for my team 
And especially what we're looking for are young, hungry software engineers that we can grow and invest in. So if you're sitting here thinking, that sounds cool, but way too advanced for me, no, no, come, come and, and show me what you got, basically. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. I'll, I'll be around after the talk if you want to chat.